My brothers and sisters, these are the days God is differentiating His church. He's differentiating His people. Whether they are people of faith or they are people of the world. Whether they are people following God or they are following all the time their own fancies in the name of God. When you invite the glory of God to come, the glory manifests God. And whenever God manifests God, the first thing He does is to judge sin. We have taught the people God will never leave you nor forsake you. No, He doesn't. But you can. Your spirit will just withdraw itself that you are not realizing that you are away from God. And we are too afraid to even preach God does walk away. Oh, but, but that's not scripture. No. The omnipresence of God is different from the manifest presence of God. The omnipresence of God is beside you and throughout the universe. The manifest presence of God is where you feel and sense, where He's manifesting His power and glory. Now, those are different matters, isn't it? He does withdraw, but the omnipresence of God will still be there. That you can't. Nobody can touch that. That is God Himself. The glory of God, when we study the glory, Paul was emphasizing God's glory. I'm going to tell you something that is going to shock you. Are you ready? Yes. Put your heart like this. I'm going, to, I'm going to shock you. Are you ready? It's not a heretical statement. It's a theological statement. God is bigger than Paul's understanding of God. That means I'm not limited to what just Paul said. Oh, but is scripture limited? No, scripture. Paul wrote that part of the scripture, not the whole Bible. So if you are just stuck to one aspect of it, oh, the New Testament, Pauline theology, you are absolutely wrong. You will be limited. Because God showed Paul enough things to shock the whole world at that time. But God is not limited to what Paul wrote. God is bigger than Paul in theology. You got to understand that. Paul was introducing through his writings with a relationship to know God. Paul was not introducing people to him. Paul. He was introducing God through his writings. You get what I'm saying? There are some aspects Paul said, I don't know. So are you going to tell that you don't know too? No, you're supposed to get to know what Paul didn't know. But somewhere there, there will be a scripture confirming there is so much. Why is that possible? Because the Bible is 6,000 years old. The lifespan of man, maximum is about 110. So you divide yourself now. 6,000 years old wisdom, you're only touching one-ten of that. 110 if you get to live until then. Say maximum 80, 90. Good thinking, active thinking years. Say 95, let's go for the bonus now. It is still just a fraction of the New Testament and you still have the Old Testament to cover. You see how much we lack so therefore, don't limit yourself to what you know. There is so much of God that we don't know yet. Amen? Amen. So Paul throws himself into that aspect, where, like even in the New Testament, Deuteronomy, it says, whatever God has revealed belongs to you. Whatever God has not revealed belongs to God. So there is an aspect, a, a volume, a kind of a, a volume which the Old Testament prophets gave, or oh, there is so much that we don't know. 
God has not revealed yet. And then in the New Testament, Paul gives a kind of an open statement. I has not seen, ears have not heard. It was not Paul, but he quoted Isaiah's prophecy. What God has prepared. Amen. And so I pray that this glory of God will get to visit us more and more. So let's look at uh, chapter 3. To start with a positive uh, vibe before I get into the negative aspect of it. Let's look at uh, verse um, 8. We uh, <clears throat> will not the ministry, okay, let's look at verse 7. Now, if the ministry of death carved in letters of stone came with such a glory that the Israelites could not gaze at Moses' face because of its glory, which was brought to an end, and that's what we talked about, will not the ministry of the Spirit have even more glory? The question is asked, will not the ministry of the Spirit will have more glory? Now, if there was a glory in the ministry of condemnation, we are looking at verse 9, the ministry of righteousness must far exceed in its glory. Are you following there is a measurement. The ministry of righteousness or the ministry of the Spirit must far exceed. So that is an invitation for us today. But I want to talk about, before establishing that, the ministry of death. Why is that the word in verse 7? Did you see that? Let's go back to verse 7. Now, if the ministry of Death. Look at that. In letters of stone came with such a glory the ministry of death. I don't think so anyone is called to do that. But there is such a ministry which Paul identified. Anything that is of the flesh is called the ministry of death. And so we got to identify, ladies and gentlemen, and those who are watching online, when you keep saying, I'm serving God, I'm doing this, are you doing a ministry of the Spirit or ministry of death? Because whatever that is not born of God, then is of the flesh. And whatever is of the flesh is called the ministry of death. You see? I'll give you an example. Let's look at uh, 2 Corinthians Chapter 1 and verse 1. Allow the Holy Spirit to minister to you today. Amen? Amen. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God. People who say, oh, I'm an apostle. Apostle of what? Here the Bible says, I'm an apostle of Christ Jesus. I'm not the apostle of men. I'm not an apostle of a denomination. I'm an apostle of Christ Jesus. That conviction must become the core of your heart. And at the level of being an apostle, you better know who you are serving. And if you are still wondering who you are serving, it is a clear-cut avenue. You're not even an apostle of Christ. Some men gave it that. Some people identified you. They look at you as an important networker. An important junction box. Some denomination does that. You know why Gary, you could hear, he laughed, right? Because he's an electrician. Junction box, electrical term. <laughs> some ministries do that. Some denomination do that. They will appoint an apostle in every, every uh, uh, state and say, we've got 50 apostles covering the America. Are you sure? Are they bearing the ministry of the spirit or the ministry of death? Hello? When you give your head to people to be prayed for who don't carry the anointing of God, they speak death into your spirit man. You will not grow. There will not be any life. You can be doing all the works. 
If you don't put, I mean, I've always been learning different things from the different guys in our church. Just to, even to have a, a plant, a, 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 a fruit plant, and you put the seed, and you got to get the right soil, and you got to get this thing going. And then, uh, uh, when, when we moved in into America, man, uh, my, my, my grass patch, patch of grass is not growing at all. I didn't know why. And, and so I called Dr. Grass to come and visit us, Larry. He's Dr. Grass. Many of you don't know his, his uh, skill, knowledge. He said, you got to put this, you got to put lime, you got to buy this. Thanks, Larry. Can you get it done, please? He said, okay, Pastor, I'll do it for you. <laughs> and then it started growing. Because you need to know what to do the right way. And then we have Dr. Soil. Gloria. <laughs> she will tell, do this, do this, do this, do this. Started growing. Praise God. Even in the ministry, there are people who bring life and there are people who bring death. Who are the people who bring death? That's what we want to discover today. We got to identify whether the church which is born of God or born of the flesh. Which is born of God will be the life of the spirit. Born of the flesh will be full of entertainment to keep people in. There must come a time that you are tired and fed up of the flesh. Then the spirit will manifest in your life, you see. If you are the time, oh, you, you like all the hype. And it, nothing wrong with hype. But there is something about being touched in the spirit and being touched in your soul. Yes, Isn't it? Don't tell me the world doesn't have enough entertainment. But we are looking for the same entertainment value of Hollywood inside the church. Yes. That is why God stands outside. Are you with me? If there is something that you are looking for in the church, it must be for Jesus. Don't look out for anything else. Look out for Jesus. It can be an unknown pastor. It can be the most smallest church. It can be the smallest town with the most boring people. But if Jesus is showing up in that little country church, then you be there. You see. Because we are teaching people to be followers of God. Not followers of men. I get very uptight when people tell me, oh, I'm following your brother. But for what? I'm following you. But for what? I didn't die on the cross, neither did he. We are told to become followers of Jesus Christ. And no wonder there is weaknesses that is coming or the ministry of death is coming through because you are not following him who carries life. The river of life. The source of life. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus. You know what's the next line he says? Timothy, our brother. What? Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Look at verse one. Don't, don't stick there. Okay. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by what? Oh, look at how firmly he knows what is God's will. When you say a man is an apostle, he knows the will of God. If not, you can't stand in that position. I get very uptight, man, when clowns introduce themselves to me. I'm an apostle. Praise God, you can, but there must be a maturity. When you touch them, it is electrifying. You know, that guy is set apart as an apostle. There is a stature of the spirit and the spiritual maturity of manhood. Not a baby. Are you with me? Please have the right measurement so that you know how to receive people. It is important to say, who are you an apostle of? Christ Jesus. If you can't say that, then we are losing the game. The Paul is writing about the ministry of death. 
the ministry of death breeds the flesh. It breeds death. It's centered around everything Jesus said, don't do it. It is centered around the worldly pleasure. It is centered around worldly fame. It is centered around world. It is centered around money without God. Hello? God's prosperity can shock us, but it's always within the framework of His will. Isn't God good? How much can God prosper me? Enough to stumble you. But will you know what to do? Do you know what to do? When God prospers you, you see. Some fellows want to prosper, but they have never given $5 to someone to bless them at all. They're always on the receiving end. Do you believe that it is more blessed to give than to receive? Now, how many times do you give? You see, it is more blessed. So why do I want to prosper? To get into that bandwagon, to give. It's more blessed than to receive. Yes, that is why I must prosper. Ah, I'm not into prosperity. <sighs> okay, then put a thousand dollars in the bucket. I don't have anything. That's why you must prosper. Because it's not about you. I've paid all my bills. It is not about you. It is about the kingdom. I wanted to think about it for a minute. There is a ministry of death and that is a ministry of life. When does death come? When God is not in the house. When God is not in the picture. When you're pursuing a dream and God is not involved in that. When you're adamantly crying, fasting and praying, using all the spiritual weapons for worldly pursuit, thinking that God can change his mind. And you're sulking away because you are praying, you are fasting, but God's presence is no longer there. You know, God's hand is not in that prayer. Are you with me? You're pursuing it. You're asking for it. You want this. Oh God, I will use the seven steps to prayer. Seven mountains of prayer. And the moment God's presence is not there, don't waste time pursuing it. One of the important ways God reveals His pleasure to us is with His still presence. Whether He's even there in what you're asking and what you're praying. And that is why we have to have a sensitive heart when we are serving God. Have a sensitive heart when you are praying. Have a sensitive heart when you are waiting before God. Because you can sense the pleasure of His presence with you. And you are pursuing some kind of prayer and people ask you to pray. You will know whether it's God's will or not because the presence is active or it's taken off. Be bold when you are praying for your children. If God's hand is not in what they're asking for, then don't flatter them in the flesh. Oh, go for it. Never. You go, you will fail. Oh, I'm sure he will make it. Are you sure? You are not God. Teach them to pursue God. Amen. Amen. Not pursue their own heart. Pursue God. Run for it, and there they will find their dream. Amen. Amen. That is a ministry of death. I want to bring you, uh, I want to give you some uh, pointers, then we will go to a very important passage to discover that. In 1 Samuel chapter 4, verse 21, there is a first time the word Ichabod will be revealed to us. 1 Samuel chapter 4 and verse 21. The ark of God will be captured. Eli was not walking right. Both of their sons was walking away from God, Hopni and Phinehas. And then in in, in chapter 4 and verse 12, for the first time, the word, Hebrew word, Ichabod will be revealed. What does it mean? The glory of God has left. It has departed. 
Whenever the flesh reigns instead of God, when the flesh rules instead of God, God has this right to walk away. I said, my God is not like that. I want to wonder which God are you really talking about? How is it possible your God is not like that if we are reading the same Bible? Some people don't even read the Bible for them to say, my God is not like that. Please read. The very first sacrifice that was offered before God, God came down and he differentiated between a sweet-smelling sacrifice and a wrong sacrifice. Straight away, the very first one. He accepted Abel's, but he rejected Cain's. Why is God so uptight about this, man? Right from day one to the first family, heaven's sake. Come on. <laughs> right to the first family, God began to teach them what is right and what is wrong. We cannot help it, man. Sometimes we are more sensitive to human feelings and we deny God's feelings. You're more attuned and attentive to your animals, your livestock at home and how they feel, but you're not even attuned to how God feels about matters. We are so attuned to our spouse and our children, how they feel and what they like. What about God, who is the king in that house? How does he feel about it? Jesus said, do not grieve the Holy Spirit. And I need to know what grieves him and what does not. And Jesus said, man, he was absolutely serious when he said, if anybody sin against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven. Would you even believe there is such a scripture in the Bible? That there is one thing he will not forgive. And I think he was serious when he talked about that. You cannot be spending your entire lifetime bashing up the Holy Spirit, thinking, I just have to say one last line before I die. Oh, forgive me in Jesus' name. Boom. He will judge you for your motive and he'll be judged right there for bashing up the Holy Spirit. Are you listening? Because you know what you're talking about. So how many theologians have been bashing up the Holy Spirit? Thanks is of the devil. What? You are speaking more like the devil too. Why don't you say I'm part of me is the devil? Because it is through the words of men problems are coming up. Humans are the one who are tearing up everything under the sun. God is the one who's building up. Are you with me? We are so afraid what belongs to God, but we are so freely accepting whatever that belongs to men. My question is, which part of the kingdom you belong to? Whenever I travel overseas, I don't understand many of their language songs. I was getting trouble in the beginning days when I started to travel because you see, what I don't understand, I didn't know how to lock into the anointing to be ready to preach the word. And then I began to pray. And then the Lord spoke to me one time uh, uh, when Brother Sadhu, you know, uh, you want to hear the story? Sadhu said, okay, prepare yourselves a youth conference. I was 21 years old. I said, okay, how many people are coming? I don't know why it's a habit of everybody asking, how many people does it come? <laughs> Maybe we pray less, prepare less, more or less, you know? Uh, so he said, probably about 25 people. You don't worry, your job is to pray and be ready. I said, okay. 25 people, not too bad. I'm, I was just starting up, right? So my brother said, until I say so, you cannot come into the... Meeting tent. Sure, but I said, why is that a big tent? He said, this is the families, they'll get to eat, they'll come and they fellowship. But the meeting is a smaller group within the tent. I, I said, fine. So, who is the first opening session? He said, it's you. What? Because the youth meeting, they want to hear you. You are from Singapore, right? Ah. I said, okay, I can do that. Worship started, then he came. He said, signal, come, come, come inside and go to the stage straight away. You are ready to speak. I said, what about worship and all that, you know? So when I went up and, they, and I walked in and I sat, my heart stopped. Seven, uh, 700 people were sitting. 
And he said, now you got to speak. I said, what? So I, I preached very prayerfully. I didn't even open my eyes. They were admiring me. What a prayerful preacher. I didn't even dare to look up. Turn the Bible. I was just looking there. I was reading this way. Crying within my heart. How to sense your presence, oh God. Then the Lord told me, don't listen to the words. Pay attention to my presence. And so I began to take note. Every time the worship leader is singing, I'll pay attention to which song carries the spirit for the day. And I'll romanize it and I will write it down. And when I go up to the stage, I'll tell the guy, sing this song. That's where the anointing lies. We got to smell the spirit. The flavor of God. In which song the, the flames of the Holy Spirit is dancing. That's the song for you. That's the song for the day perhaps. Are you with me? Look out for the ministry of the Holy Spirit. How God wants to minister to you. That is why it's called the ministry of death or the ministry of the Spirit. The flesh will bring death. The Spirit will bring life. Therefore, any ministry you want to do, make sure God is in it. Don't say, ah, that's a great idea. Man, all problems start because of ideas. Every problem starts because of ideas. Find out whether God is in it. When you know God is in it, then you don't wait for people's approval. You bulldoze it in the front, whether who's with you or not. No, not everybody can do that. Some guys are anointed with the anointing of a pioneer. Who is a pioneer? Pioneer goes forward because nobody has done it. They are the first to go forward. There is no predecessor to look at an album and say this is how it should be done. They are the one who's setting all the principles. Amen. Pioneering guys have got boldness, they got courage, they'll bulldoze down everything under the sun and they will do what God wants them to do. Amen. But and others are builders after pioneers. They may not have the same level of courage and faith, but they have the ability to build what the pioneers have done. That's another grace. Amen. The ministry of death and the ministry of the Spirit. Eli thought, well, if I die, God appoints another one. But that day, God began to declare, Ichabod, God has left the place. How is that possible? How come God left? God leaves when he feels, let me use the word, emotional words. When God feels, he's no longer wanted. Paul uses the scripture. He said, oh foolish Galatians. Galatians, you started off in the spirit, you ended up in the flesh. It is all nice when you are starting something. Oh, God said this and God said that and it is all full of the spirit. And when you catch up with success, the flesh takes over and the spirit will be left behind. You wanted God in your initial stages. And when you get everything going, God, don't worry, I got this. What? <laughs> he got this, eh? All right, go for it. We'll see how far. But God is a gentleman. He will not destroy what he's doing. I begin to find out. You see, I, I found out, do you believe that? The, hey, listen, I, I'm willing to teach you some wisdom. Are you want to you listen? Yes. The Bible says, Whatever the righteous man will do with his hands, it will prosper. It's a blessing of the word of God in Psalms chapter 1. But I told Jesus, I know your word says that. But I don't want to build anything, you are not in it. I know you want to bless my hand, but I want to see your hand first before I touch. Because I'm so afraid. Why some of the problems we created, it is prospering? Because God promised whatever you touch, it will prosper. So be careful in what you touch. You carry life in you. 
If you touch the wrong things, it will prosper and it will become a snare to your own soul. Look out for God's ideas, especially in this end time, because the enemy will open doors to derail you. I got to watch. Now, not everybody got to watch out as a hawk like those who have a destiny and God's calling very specific in your life, the more you must pay attention. Amen? Amen. I wanted to show, uh, let's go to Ezekiel chapter 8. A very serious passage where God is uh, speaking about Ichabod, the book of Ezekiel. Someone asked me the other day, um, can you be a little bit more easy on Sunday and a little bit hard on uh, Wednesday? Uh, is it okay? I'll try. But uh, when God is there, God is there. God's word is God's word. I don't find an easy Sunday and a hard Wednesday. I, I don't know how to differentiate myself. If it's God, it's go, man. In chapter 8, there was this abomination. Ezekiel was a man just like any other person. I tell you what Ezekiel was. He was a priest. But Israel went under captivity. All the furnitures and articles of furniture of worship was confiscated, seized. He's not a priest without all this. See the Old Testament guys, without those things, they don't know what else to do. Are you ready for the next uh, revelation? When he can no longer be a priest, God released an anointing on him to become a prophet. God is not subjected to our conditions. God is not limited to this or to that. God can change your calling. God can give a new spirit upon you. The problem is we like worshipping all things. We like worshipping things that brought glamour to you. And so you'll keep going back to the old stuff. You know, I used to. I used to. Get out of the used to and ask God to show you something tomorrow. I found that in the scripture, man. From being a priest, God anointed him to be a prophet. And then the spirit of God came upon him. And the Lord said, now Ezekiel, come, I'm going to show you something. Not to many prophets, God, in fact, the Old Testament prophets, God showed the grieving part of his personality. God brought them into the nations and showed the sin. God revealed to the prophets the anger that God was having against sin. They got to see the private part of God and say, go and tell to these people. But this time to Ezekiel, God showed him how he feels about his house. And say, Ezekiel, come, I want to show you something. The Bible says in verse 1, the hen of the Lord. Let's say, in the sixth year, in the sixth month, on the fifth day of the month, as I sat in my house with the elders of Judah sitting before me, the hen of God fell upon me there. Then I looked and behold, a form that had the appearance of men. And then the story goes on. Now I wanted to... Go home, pay attention to this passage, okay? But look at uh, verse 3. He put out the form of a hand and took me by a lock of my head. If it encourages some people in order for you to experience all this, you really must have some long hair, okay? I don't want to even look up, man. And the Spirit lifted me up between the earth and heaven and brought me in the visions of God to Jerusalem to the entrance of the gateway of the inner court that faces north. Where was what? Can you all read together? What was there? I'm talking about the temple of God. I'm talking about the temple of God. God brought him inside. I want to see 
who is sitting there? The Bible says, there was a seed of the image of jealousy which provokes to jealousy. Do you realize that? Whenever there is a demonic spirit of jealousy, it will provoke people to be jealous. Verse 4, And behold, the glory of the Lord of Israel was there, like the vision that I saw in the valley. So God's glory was there, and there was another glory called the seat of jealousy. Are you following the passage? You want me to go on? I'll show you what happens in this passage, okay? Because you need to know the characteristics. What happens when the ministry of death is there? What happens when man rules? What happens when the flesh rules? Will God just depart? No, he doesn't. He's still there, convicting, correcting to the point and then there is no return. So here, the Bible says, the seat of jealousy was there. The glory of God was there. Now, God shows him, verse 6, and he said to me, son of man, do you see what they are doing? The great abominations that the house of Israel are committing here? To what? Can we all read together as one accord? To what? Do you think it's possible? Absolutely. There are things that we can do to drive God far from the sanctuary that was actually built for him in the very first place. When we worship money, then you will start worshiping all those who carry big money. You, 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 I'll show you. All that you need to whisper now as I'm ministering God's word to you, whisper in your heart, Holy Spirit, show yourself to me now. That's all you got to say. He will show you his burden, you see. I don't want to become a, to be known as a great as preacher or speaker, but I want to carry his burden, his heart. Sometimes he will tell you, just be quiet. Sometimes he'll give you a word. And here, there are people who are doing abominations. And God said, you know, these fellas, the things they do, they are, it is to drive me far from my sanctuary. Then God says, but you will still see greater abomination than this. And then let's go down to verse 9. Now he said to me, now there will be a hole in the wall and uh, he will go through. Now I, I just want to say for those, uh, for, for a matter of encouragement, I had the same type of a visitation once while I was in the, uh, praying in my room early in the morning. The Lord said, come, now I will show you what is happening into that church. There was a hole and I entered in and I saw the abominations in the house. And I spoke that warning to that church. Of course, it's not easy, right? You'll be branded up, a minister from this, a prophet of death, blah, 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 blah. And right two years, right after destroying all the little reputation that you can have in the ministry, the pastor died while baptizing others on the seaside, on the seaside. He just died. Other members came and offered apology. I said, I'm not looking for any apology from any man. You didn't sin against me. You sinned against the very God who spoke those words, you see. Are you with me, guys? I don't play games. And not everybody is given that ministry to do. Some are called to carry those words. I went in and I saw and there engraved on the wall all around was every form of creeping things and lots of beasts and all the idols of the house of Israel. Creeping and in the wall in Hebrew means snakes. There were snakes in the temple of God. 
And then verse 11, before them stood 70 men of the elders of the house of Israel, with Jazaniah, the son of Shaphon, standing among them. Each had his own censer in his hand. The smoke of the cloud of incense went up. Are you ready? Now I want you to read verse 12. Then he said, son of man, have you seen what the elders of the house of Israel are doing in the dark? Each in his room of pictures. You see, pride takes selfie. Do you understand? When men rule a church, they will make a picture of themselves and hang it. I'm the one who did it. But when God rules the church, then his throne is being honored. I'm not saying don't put your picture. That's not what I'm saying. But if all that you see is just that, then I want to know who was the God of this man, not just the man. But America cannot help that disease, worshiping the man more than his God. Isn't it? May God judge us more lest we fall into that trap in this church. That God is the one. He's the center of the throne. No man can go there. Every man was taking the pictures. Oh, I thought it was a man. Verse 14. Then he brought me to the entrance of the north gate of the house of the Lord. Behold, there sat woman weeping for Tammuz. It's another idol. Verse 16. And he brought me into the inner court of the house of the Lord. And behold, at the entrance of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, were about 25 men with their backs to the temple of the Lord. And their faces to the east, worshipping the sun towards the east. Now this is inside the temple, inside the church, leaders, people, their backs are facing, the back is facing the cross, if I can put it that way, and their faces are not watching the people. They are having some form of an occultic worship of the sun god. But they are in the church. You got to be smelling and discerning. When you go into worship services, bro, I'm not saying go with a suspicious heart. But if you can't find God, I pray you look at their face. Are they looking at the glory are they worshipping the sun? You don't know, out there. When men and women of God become delusional, when they don't have the touch of the Holy Spirit in their life, they can sound like a preacher, they can quote the very Bible, but their face is not radiating the glory of God. It is the glory of selves and the ability of their oratory skills. It is the ability to make punch statements to drive the nail, but Jesus is no longer there. Sunday service looks more like a motivational seminar talk rather than a place where God ministered to me. We associate the words of men and God so much so to write on the same power level, you don't know what is God and what is man anymore. No wonder at the seat where the throne of God should be, there was another image of jealousy sitting. That means God is no longer on the throne. He was there, but he was not on the throne. Are you following? And then you will read in Ezekiel chapter 9, God will send the angels to judge them and all of them will be killed. And then in chapter 10, the Bible says, the glory of God has departed. 
My brothers and sisters, these are the days God is differentiating his church. He's differentiating his people. Whether they are people of faith or they are people of the world. Whether they are people following God or they are following all the time their own fancies in the name of God. Because the glory, you see, when you invite the glory of God to come, the glory manifests God. And whenever God manifests God, the first thing He does is to judge sin. That is why before the great showdown is coming upon the earth, where the glory of God will manifest, the Bible says, judgment has begun in the house of God. One of the scary scriptures that I'm so afraid, when the book of Revelation says, let him sin continue to do what he's doing. Let him who's pure and holy continue to be holy and pure what he's doing. Because the day is now coming. They will be judged. Are you following brothers and sisters? How important it is. It doesn't matter how big or small our church is. It is important to walk right before God. Let the church grow when we are doing it right because the more we save souls, the more we are bringing in people a harvest of salvation from death. And that's what God wants us to do. Now I'm talking about, you see, it's very stressful when you're talking about the ministry of death. Do people like death? No. But people like a foul spirit? No. No then we, if we do things in church or in your life, in your family, with your children, if you do things of death, it will bring a foul smell. Amen. Don't deserve death. Don't go near there. All of us have experienced death and now we are in Christ Jesus. Somebody say amen. amen. Now we are so addicted to life we are so addicted to peace. We are so addicted to joy. We don't go back to this world again. When the flesh rules, the glory departs. What you read in Ezekiel chapter 8, when leadership rules the church in the flesh, the glory of God will leave. When we do things to violate the laws of God, the glory will leave. The building will be there, but the glory will not be there. The leaders will be there, but God will not be there. The preaching will be there, but the Holy Spirit will be absent. A beautiful singing position will be there, but God will not accept the sacrifice. The Bible says, the prayers of a man who doesn't walk with God, who doesn't honor God's word. The Bible says, even his, uh, his prayer is an abomination to my ears. That means he said, when he's praying, I will not listen. You see, these are matters that we have to teach. Not only when God does, because if we teach only one way, then I'm afraid we have been teaching about an idol who's not alive. <laughs> because an idol doesn't have feelings. <laughs> an idol is only one way. You can throw something and they won't be afraid anymore. But God is a living God. He sees. Amen. And the Bible says, I got to make sure God's glory doesn't depart. And if I'm to make sure God's glory doesn't depart, then there must be the ministry of the Spirit and not the ministry of death. Now, I can keep giving all these passages, different examples in the Bible, that people took it for granted. That God won't say anything. He can't listen. He can't hear. But God did and God judged. Some of them repented. For example, you'll find in the book of Judges, chapter 16 and 17, when Samson was doing his ministry, the Bible says, and he did not know the Holy Spirit left him. 
He did not know that the Holy Spirit left him. That is why in Psalms chapter 51, when David sinned against God, when he was crying, wash me with his soul, then he cried to God, do not remove the Holy Spirit from me. From then on, it became a fear of God between the history of God that God can leave someone. And people begin to cry out. No one has articulated that intimacy with God like the way David did. Do not take the Holy Spirit from me. My brothers and sisters, these are the days, it's not about how clever our ministry is, it's not how expensive that we do, it is not what kind of instruments we have and how much uh, visual we're becoming online, is God in action in our church. Amen. And you know how he comes? When we humble ourselves and fast and pray. We need to exemplify not just the beauty of our outward appearance, but the beauty of the spirit man. Before God. Amen? Amen. Now I'll bring you back to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Why is that we call a ministry of death? What happens in a church? What are the characteristics? I'm not going to go too much, but I'm going to give you some pointers for you to take note. Whenever people tell me, oh, I'm anointed. I can do this and I can do that. The first thing I want to do, stand close enough to smell how they smell like. Then observe their works, what they are doing. If the works doesn't match, then I don't have to bother anymore. They cannot say, I want to serve God, but your match, your works doesn't match up. Doesn't impress me at all. I'm so anointed to change the world. Praise God. Change your time first. I don't see what time you're coming, what time you're going. Are you listening? Yes. It affects. Don't be a Cinderella in church. All the time having wishing prayer. I wish I'll be this. I wish I'll be that. There are too many Cinderellas in the church. I want to have people who are real. That they don't change after midnight. <laughs> <laughs> oh, pastor, you know, the moment I have this financial breakthrough, I tell you. I tell you what I will do for God. If God will just strike a million dollars in the casino, you know what I will do? The first thing, I'll give it to the church first. Oh, there's a lot of people, man, who think that God is begging them for his money. God, if you will just prosper me, I tell you, I will do everything. <laughs> Show me now. What you do when you don't have because your character is forming. When you're a nobody, your character is being formed up. When you're beaten by the fire, your character is forming. And no matter how much God blesses you, on that day, you'll still stand. You see. I wanted to think about this for a minute. Oh, pastor, you know, the church is going slow and we are, we are growing slow. Never mind. Let our characters be formed up now. Amen. Don't grow too fast first. Hold it. Let's know together because when the fight starts, we got to keep it going. God is building us. It's called the ministry of the Holy Spirit. What happens when there is a ministry of death? Number one, mold grows. Whenever there is no fresh air, molding takes place. Pay attention whenever there's no fresh air, you'll see even your clothes and your things that you have changes. White spots takes place. You know there is no fresh air coming through. And there are many times it is like that, even in church, when we do things, when there is no touch of the Holy Spirit, don't worship those things. Throw it away and ask God to show you what we need to do. Amen. What happens about the ministry of death? Number one, the works of the flesh will be there. Number one is molding. Number two, the works of the flesh. Number three, the desires of the world comes inside. The church wants to be the number one. They want to be like the Hollywood. And then they want to follow after the lusts of the world. 
What is the lust of the world? I don't know. There is a, such a differentiation between needs, blessing, and now the lusts of the world. Is God after against you being blessed? No, absolutely not. But if you are thinking to be just like the Hollywood, absolutely it's going to come against you. Does he want you to be a multimillionaire? Absolutely, yes. But if you pursue the world to get it, he will come against you. People don't know how to maintain a holy life and a prosperous life. In their mind is either poverty means godliness, richness means the world. They just don't know how to be blessed like the children of Abraham. Hello? People told me, you know how Abraham was rich. People tell me, oh, you must be like Abraham. Oh, he was so rich. I tell you why he was rich. He's got nothing to spend his money on. He was in the wilderness, bro. <laughs> no bills to pay. Everything is there. How expensive is your house? In a tent. Praise God, brother. You pay more bills in the winter because you're a heater. <laughs> When the flesh serves, death is brooding. The leadership becomes like Pharisees. Was God, was Jesus against the law of God? No, he was not. He was against the Pharisees. He was running after the Sadducees. Did he ever shake hand and say, brother, I'm going to go, man. Two more days, I'll be on the cross. Let's make peace. Did he ever apologize to them? Hello? Hello? Well, why do you apologize to the flesh? Why do you think you have to go back to someone who broke the church apart and apologize to them? I'm sorry, you know, it's not me. Actually, it's them. But I would just support you. You were supporting the flesh and you're speaking through your teeth that you will do that. See, what happens when you support the flesh? The infestations of the flesh, the molding enters your spirit, man. Then death will start brooding in you. Breathing in you. You will not know the difference between life and the spirit. We are so afraid to put your reputation to what God is saying. It's God's word, you know. It's not me. Are you sure? Why is there two personalities in you? Are you so embarrassed about God? People say that. It's not me. If it's not for the word of God, I will still support you. What? God wants you to stand for Him Amen. so that He stands for you. Amen. See, you need to have some guts when you're following Jesus, bro. You need to have some courage when you're serving God. And one of the courage you must have when you're following God and serving God is the power to say no. Even within children, you know, listen, parents, Parents, are, when the, you know, some parents, the brokenness they go through forever trying to get the appraisal of their children. Wow. What's wrong with you? The world teaches you how to be this parent, how to be that parent, how to be that parent. Why don't someone for a change write a book for the child how to be a God-honoring child? How to be a parent-honoring child? For once in a lifetime, switch the books and let them read. You know, when you don't have the favor of God in your life, you'll run after everybody else's favor. Start with God first. Then God's favor will come on you and bring healing to your children, bring healing to your family, and bring healing to the whole family as a whole. Are you with me? It's important to know that what God is doing, the ministry of death, you got to feel it, you know. When you talk about the movement of the Holy Spirit, look at that. When the ministry of death is there, there will be condemnation. Now, all these are the scriptures. I want you to go home, pay attention to Ezekiel 8, 9, and 10. Pay attention to 2 Corinthians chapter 3 that this entire series is based on. There will be condemnation. They'll be brooding on curses. 
And that amazes me all the time. One day you say you are set free from all the curse of the law. God has set my entire generation free. Another day you freely use the word, curses are active. How, how can God be wrong? I want you to understand this. God is so upset. Are you following? He said, do not even pronounce the name of other gods in your mouth. In your mouth, don't say it. Don't mention another God. He's so upset when he's uptight about it. There shall be no other God beside me. Do you believe in Jesus? Yes. Oh, yes. Do you believe he's the only God? Um, <clears throat> Others may not. That is why a salvation is not complete until they can acknowledge there is no other God besides Jesus. People go to India and, they, and uh, the Americans, well, listen, I'm, I'm just saying politely, but you need to know about all this when you go for mission field, right? They will say yes to anything that you do. You may think, oh, is it? oh a thousand people accept the Christ. Go and ask him, Besides Jesus, there is no other God. Only those put up your hand. Then you'll see the thousand, probably a few hundred will come down because they cannot acknowledge that. That means that day the salvation is not complete. I believe God is now going from church to church to have a clean sweep of salvation experience even to our children. It was when we were in the New York Punjabi church, when I spoke about the salvation. You know, many children came there as well to be prayed for. I want to make sure there's a clean sweep. There is an authentication that I'm truly safe from inside. That whatever we do for God, there must be the seal of the Holy Spirit. Not just another good idea. Because blessed be to the name of God, we have 440 churches in Cleveland County. So you don't have to repeat the same thing over and over again. God did not bring Jesus my King to repeat what everybody else is doing. He called us to speak the power of God when nobody else wants to do it. Amen. You and I have to find where do we stand. And in Cleveland County, when you talk about the power of the Holy Spirit, you are swimming against the current. Bro, you don't swim against the current, no. All those who know how to swim against the current is called a triathlon athlete. <laughs> Only those who dare to swim against the current, somebody say, I will dare. Make up your mind this morning. I will dare to live for God. Because I don't want to breed the church to become a ministry of death. It must remain as the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Look at with me to, in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 5. 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 5. <clears throat> I want to tackle another area. Having the appearance of godliness... They will deny the power of God. Can you please read to me loud and clear so that all the people online can hear you? Are you ready? How will they hear you? Because we have mics, don't worry. <laughs> One, two, three, go. Now shout. Will you dare to do that? You see? We won't. Because we want to be loving and kind and all that. That is great outside the house. But inside, Bible says avoid. That means I got to pay attention to preaching who gives a clever disguised form of preaching but denies the power of God. Avoid such preaching. I'm not preaching a Pentecostal gospel. Please don't. Don't brand me. I'm not interested in preaching Pentecostal. I want to preach Jesus Christ of Nazareth, bro. He's a complete picture. 
avoid such people. And so I want to, I want to deal right now with all of us so that we will not be deceived in our walk with God, having an appearance. And the Greek word for appearance is called mosis, where you call the metaphosis, you know, the change. Mosis. An appearance of godliness. Put up some makeup and come to church. Look godly for Sunday. Smile when you come in so people, nobody will know. They have an appearance. But the real ugly man is inside. Silently they will deny the power of God. But their powerful posture, stature, money, status. Oh, you don't offend them, bro. If you offend them, the church will lose its class in society. Will we dare to do that? How will we build the church without them? God said, I will build his church. Hello? Huh? Jesus said, I will be, we can't afford this. We don't have to have anything, bro. We will do it with nothing and serve the almighty God. Amen. That's the courage. Because one day we won't have all this, you know. There will come a time we will be hunted. There will come a time all this will become illegal. But we will be in the wilderness. What a wonderful day. I don't have to pay rent. <laughs> And you don't have to collect love offering anymore. Woo! <laughs> but even in the wilderness, God said, give your love offering to me. <laughs> he wanted to bring them into a cycle of blessing. If we can trust you in the wilderness, he will trust you in the city. Avoid such people. Avoid such books. Avoid such preaching. On the other hand, you have the Pentecostal writers. If you read their books, you know, if you read their books, you know, sometimes I read this fellow's book and I'll finish in five minutes because there's nothing much to read. It's all the gaba gaba stories. I went to the hotel. I, I switched on the house. Wow, glory to God. The black, and then I went to the, uh, 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 to the lobby. There was a fruit spread. Oh, glory to God. And I find out the scriptures, how many scriptures there is there? There'll be about three scriptures. Everything else is just a waste of time. And there are people who read such books and they say, oh, you know, the power of God came through such. All these voodoo people, man, I tell you. If there is no scripture, there is no power. What are you talking about? What are you talking about? The power of God was there. In a conference, Jesus is being spoken less than three times sometimes. You're talking about the power of God. That means there is a form of godliness. Are you with me? Let's upgrade our standard for Jesus Christ. I'm so uptight about this because the Lord, I told you on that and that Wednesday, he just shied it and say, the church doesn't know what my glory is. So I'm running after, I say, God, show me. I just want to know a little bit. Little bit to touch your favor. Little bit to worship you. Little bit enough to just climb one level up further. Just a little bit. In my lifetime before I die. Just a little bit. So that we don't have the appearance without the form. You know, I don't know, maybe some of our younger people in, in, in church today, this morning. If I bring you to Romans chapter 2, you may lose yourself. There. It's a very important, powerful passage. Paul, he likes a good fight, bro. He was grinding the Jewish fellows. He was grinding them to make it so personal. He said, your circumcision is nothing if you are not born again in your heart. Oh God. In a Jewish culture, you can go that far and confront the man. You talk about circumcision. He just said, it is nothing if you are not circumcised in your heart. Can you believe that? Go and read that. Go and read that challenge. 
He says, your prayer is nothing if you're not circumcised in your heart. Your offering is nothing. Your giving is nothing. Your service is nothing if you're not circumcised in your heart. God is saying your circumcision is invalid when God is not on it. How can I even say, God, I did this for you and I did that for you? And so God, I'm grinding this matter to you so that we will avoid death at all costs. We will avoid the ministry of death at all costs. We will avoid duplicity. Don't duplicate what someone did and he died. If it's died, don't do it again. Because death will follow duplicate ministries. Don't worship a method. It's done. Worship God. Somebody say amen. I want to encourage you to become people of God's word. You know, some of you may know, especially from those guys of uh, a Baptist orientation, you know uh, Francis Chan, right? He, almost, he, he came out from the Baptist. Uh, he said, when I read the Bible, his one line that touched me the most. When I read the Bible, all my life I was thought God doesn't heal the sick. But I read the Bible, Jesus heals people. And then when he went to Cambodia, he and his family and a ministry team, they laid hands on people and they were healed instantly. And he said, that's not my theology. And God said, yes, but that's mine. So now he has to change. He cannot defend his old theology. He has to defend the power of the living God. And so perhaps you and I can come to those experience. I was once blind, but now God opened my eyes that I can see. That I may see the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Paul, then he, let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Are you learning something? In 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And then now we are looking at verse 9. We saw it earlier. Now you will know why he's emphasizing the ministry of the Spirit. In verse 9, for if there was glory in the ministry of condemnation. Now, in some of your translation, we'll say the ministry of death. That's what we are talking about just now. Comma. The ministry of righteousness must far exceed in its glory. So now I'm asking God, show me the more exceeding glory. If I keep my standard too low, then I will never get to see the bigger glories of God. I must learn to climb up more. To come into the presence of God more. To see more than what God has done. Don't reduce God. Reduce though. Don't reduce God. Somebody say, come up. What happens in the ministry of the Holy Spirit? Now, remember, use this scripture as a reference point. I'm giving you pointers now. What happens when the ministry of the Holy Spirit is taking place in your life? Number one, you are growing in righteousness. There will be conviction of God there. Your righteousness is growing. Number two, the Bible says wherever the spirit of God is, there is what? You are not in bondage, freedom. You are showing freedom. You have a freedom to obey God. You are no longer a slave. You are not a slave to anything. You are set free by Jesus. Amen. Amen. The ministry of the Spirit. Number one, there is righteousness. Number two, there is freedom. Number three, when people come to church, there is worship. You can see them worshiping God because they are set free. They are set free. 
You know, some people, uh, you, you, you bring them to Asia and they walk past uh, other Hindu temples or Buddhist temples or, you know, different. You don't have to go to Asia. In fact, North Carolina, everywhere else there is, right? And I've heard a lot of uh, people commenting when they walk, oh, you know, I feel like, you know, when I walk past the territorial, even when people are driving past, they will comment. You know, I can feel there is a darkness. Oh, driving past. Wait till you step inside, then you will know what death is all about. Just going nearby, the circumference you feel death. What about when you enter in? My father was a Hindu worshiper. God, uh, I was one. I know what it means. But Jesus has set us free. He given us the freedom. I can talk to God. He is my father. You can never know what that means, bro, until you come before his presence. You can ask Angeline. She was running after all the idols, looking for peace, looking for God. <coughs> Ministry of worship. The fourth fruit that will be there when the spirit of God is working in your life, you will love the word of God. You will love the preaching of God's word. Somebody say what? I can't just take it. I can't take it. Maybe there is some demon in you that you can't take it. How the same person who say they can't take it, they go for lunch and they'll be sitting and talking there for two hours. All the garbage in the world will be talked about. But they can take that. They don't mind. And the next door person who's next table will be using vulgarity. Ah, oh, that's not too bad. That's a well. But in God's house, they can't take strong preaching. It's too heavy, you know. You're feeling it. <laughs> Come, I'll resuscitate you in the life of God. You are showing all the symptoms of death. You can't take when life is coming in. I'll resuscitate you by the power of the Holy Spirit. One brother told me, oh, you know, when the Holy Spirit come upon you, you must jerk and then you know it is Holy Ghost. I say, no problem. Singapore current is 220 voltage. That is there. Put your hand there and pray in the Spirit. Ah! You will see Jesus by no time. Everybody will try to corner you down. Are you following I tell you what happens. Righteousness, number one. Number two, freedom. Number three, there is worship. Number four, you will love the word of God. And number five, then we'll get out from there. There will be an authenticity about you. You will practice what you preach. Paul was running after the Pharisees because they never practice what they preach. Jesus, man, on all his preaching, uh, Jesus walked past the Pharisee who was speaking, Our Father who art in heaven, our Lord be thy name. He said, beware of all the fellows wearing long robes and say, oh God. <laughs> Man, you must have some guts to hang around Jesus, you know, every day. You don't know when you'll be arrested because it's the way he speaks. Beware of all those who bring long prayers. Oh God. Because the Holy Spirit was not there. So be authentic. If you say you are a child of God, show the signs you are a child of God. If I have to come and convince you to serve God in the church, pray, worship. If I have to convince you 10 times, you better go for rebaptism. That means you are not authentic anymore. It's simple as that. What if I leave the church? Please leave. God will bring those who have the life of God. Jesus said, if you don't worship me, I will command the stones to sing glory to my name. That's the courage Jesus preached with. Oh, we need some kind of boldness here, man. Are you following? And I'm not irritating anybody. I'm irritating the flesh. You got to irritate your own flesh. So that the Spirit of God can manifest. 
Uh, it, whatever I'm saying applies to the young person, the youth, the girl, the boy, the father, and the mother. If I have to convince you to serve God in this church, then you are not a, born again in the spirit. If you are not born again in the spirit, get that sorted out first before serving. Because we don't have goofy people serving in the ministry of death. We want people who serve in the ministry of the Spirit. Are you with me? I'm, I'm serious. If that is God's criteria and quality, then I have to follow the branding of God. We, we call this the ISO 9001 seal. The quality branding of heaven. Do you have that here? Yeah. See? What do you do when you go shopping? Straight away, like, oh, everybody amazes me. They have become food scientists. Everybody turns and, oh, milligram, how many? So, for size, okay, this is good for me. It never amazes me what people do. You can see them when you go, the mall, straight away. They don't even know the contents of their own blood. You know what is... But they can read. Oh. And by the time they shop and come out, it is like 35 hours. Aisle by aisle. You are so concerned what goes into your body, right? I'm concerned what goes into your spirit. man. And there's nothing wrong with good preaching. Let's go tackle one more scripture before we give it a rest today. If not, I need to resuscitate you again. <laughs> Matthew chapter 5. The gospel of Matthew chapter 5. Verses 17 to 20. Jesus said, do not think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to what? Okay. So we will tackle this, all these fellows who talk about the grace gospel to make it sound that the law of God is no longer active. Okay. Okay. Are we against the grace preachers? No, we are not. We are against grace preaching. Preaching. Okay. Is grace preaching wrong? Absolutely not. Paul introduced that. The excessiveness becomes wrong. I have not come to ab abolish them, but to what? Verse 18. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth passes away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Wow. That means Jesus is saying, not until the cross of Calvary, he made a reference until heaven and earth will pass away. The law of God will be fulfilled. It is not abolished, it's not put away. Because if you say all the laws have gone, that means the Ten Commandments are in, invalid. That means all of us can sleep with someone, all of us can kill somebody else. We can have covetousness and have other gods. And Jesus said something we have to open our eyes. Are you ready? Yes. He says now, verse 19, therefore, whoever, whoever what? Oh, God. <laughs> Are you relaxing about the commandments? Look at that. Whoever what? Oh, come on, English people. Say it loud in the American way. Whoever what? Ah. One of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called what? Now, I'm not going to name anybody. That includes me too. If I preach less about God, you'll be a nobody in the kingdom. 
if I say anything less about God's command, which was written by the finger of God. So who was Paul attacking? He was attacking the law which brought contamination to man without God. He was not attacking the Ten Commandments. He was attacking the rituals of men. Now the Bible says, in the kingdom of heaven, but whoever does them and teaches them, oh no. Are we supposed to go back to the Ten Commandments and do it? Is that what it teaches here? What do you think, yes or no? I want you to think now. We are supposed to fulfill the Ten Commandments through the power of the Holy Spirit, but we are not supposed to fulfill the pharisaical demands of religion. You don't go to church because you gave tithe to the church. You go to, you go to heaven because you accepted Jesus as your personal savior, not because you are giving money to church. So when there is any kind of preaching that makes demands on the money and equal that to kingdom, God is saying they will be least. Because they are equa equating themselves to the commandments of God. Okay, are you ready? Yes. Tell your neighbor, are you ready? Okay. Yes. Now for us, the New Testament fanatics, look at that. <laughs> for I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that the stripes and the Pharisees, you will what? Can you handle that? Our righteousness that we say today, you and I, the New Testament saint, the New Testament child of God, you are saying, I'm set free from the Lord. Now, uh, from the law, he's saying to you, unless your righteousness exceeds. Say the word exceed. If it's not exceeding, if it's not, he says you will never enter the kingdom. So I don't have to worry about God's commandment. I got to pay attention to the, 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 the foolish Pharisees. Just don't do what they are doing. I should be okay. Do you see that? Pay attention. There are fellows in the church who have become Pharisees. They honor their constitution more than the word of God. And they defend their constitution instead of defending the word of God. They have three scriptures peppered in the constitution and have 5,000 pages of their requirements. <laughs> God is saying, we have to far exceed. God did not start a good work in us to stop. He said, well, where is the right uh, Pharisee? I want to imagine, just imagine, okay, this is the Pharisee. Now, he, he prays five hours, he does this, he does that, and he's far exceeding. But I'm just a new believer, I'm starting out. And I'm growing and I'm growing and God's Holy Spirit is dealing with me. Don't stop, keep growing. Why? Because there is a mark. The mark of the Pharisee is perfection. He's still righteous in his own way, but there is a limit to him, right? So I have to grow and grow and the power of the Holy Spirit grow and grow. And now you are breakthrough. You have already exceeded him. In walking in the power of the Holy Spirit, not just in the power of the law. So God's spirit is working in all of us to exceed. That is why don't be distracted by funny preaching and eschatological statements in this time. Focus on your growth in God and save people into salvation. Build the church, build the house of God. Why do we need to build a church? <laughs> don't ask silly question. If you don't have hospitals, people die. And we saw that during COVID.
COVID. You, people were begging to go inside the hospital. Why are you begging when you, build, when you believe in self-health? Why are you worried that we don't have enough hospitals? We don't have enough doctors? I thought everybody believes in self-health, right? You believe in chemists? Ah, oh, they are not open. Now you know. Why is it important to have proper hospitals? Therefore, do not ever even dare to say we don't need the church. Ah, oh, I don't believe in church. I like this kind of people. I want to see them on the end time. I hope they are part of my company. I'll make sure I'll grill them like a barbecue grill. <laughs> and tell them to write a million times, I love the church. I love the church. I love the church. Say that a million times, then you come in. Because you are denying the very thing that Jesus died for. Amen. How dare you will do anything less in the house of God when Jesus said, I will build my church. House church, is it a replacement for the house of God? No, it is not. It is another extension of God's house. Oh, but I am the church. You are an individual extension of the kingdom of God. You are not a replacement. Is the church replacing Israel? Absolutely not. Israel has a distinctive call and God's grace and favor on her. You can never touch her. God's hand is on her. No matter what she does, God's revival, judgment is coming on Israel. It will come back. But God is paying attention to you as a child of God. Because unless your righteousness exceeds, you will not enter the kingdom of God. That is why I stop struggling with people if they don't love the church or they don't serve the church, serve in the house of God. I don't struggle with them anytime because there will come a day this scripture will judge them. We say, oh, but you know, pastor, my, my children are studying. So are you saying this scripture doesn't apply or what? My daughter is studying. It applies. They are going for university. There comes a day the university of the kingdom will examine them. What about passing that day, that test? Are you preparing your children for that? Or just about our earthly exams? Am I not a parent who have taught our children? Absolutely, I taught them the same thing. I taught them the word. Pass and do well, but do well in this. Why must I teach them? The truth is, as afraid as I can be to even say it. Living tomorrow, either me, my wife, or my children, tomorrow is in the hands of my living God. Amen. You won't even know tomorrow you are okay. Are you with me? Unless it exceeds. My brothers and sisters, people say they want God's word. But when God's word is said it in God's way, we won't be able to take it. And I want to pray that to, this morning we will have this encounter with Jesus. It must far exceed. People have told me this many times, so we'll stop here and we're going to pray. I'm going to ask the worship team to come and just prepare yourself. People have told me, I know the advisors, uh, marriage counselors will give, pastors have even said that. <clears throat> and I want to stand contrary to it, okay? Listen. When your family is breaking up, take a break from church and go and build your family. When your marriage is breaking up, take a break from the ministry, go and build your family. When your spouse or husband is walking away to the world, you walk with them, go back into the world. Is that godly advice? Yeah. But that's the advice everybody wants to give and that's the advice everybody follows. When people told me that a long time ago, I only told them one answer. Jesus died for me, not anybody else. Amen. I will not give up the cross for anybody else. Amen. What if the church walks away? Oh, bro, I'm a champion. I tell you, I have enough strength to pull the church forward by the power of the Holy Spirit. 
I have fasted more than I've ate. Sometimes when I'm doing ministry, when I'm doing foundational ministry years, we fasted so many times in that one year, we lost more than 20 people from our church in Singapore. And I was wondering why these godly people are going off. So I, I had lunch with them and I spoke to them. He said, if we remain in your church, we will die of starvation. <laughs> because you keep fasting, you keep fasting and not eating. We can't take it anymore. We are fasting more than eating. I said, how can that be? Because the, the, you got a breakthrough in the spirit, you see. Food, you'll have any time. But that glory when it comes. And I pray in Jesus, my King. We cannot have the King without His glory. We cannot have the King without the throne. We cannot have a form of appearance and the power is not there. If the King is sitting on this throne, the power will come. If the King is sitting on His throne, the glory will shine. If the King is sitting on His throne, there will be pure worship. Can we all arise together and say, God, touch my heart this morning. And those who are watching online, if you are not well, you are going through hard times, I pray the power of the Holy Spirit will reach out to you. No matter where you are, as you will wait before God right now and worship together, the Holy Spirit will come through, touch you in the same way He's touching everybody in this room. Our love and prayer goes out to you. The Holy Spirit is there as much as He's you. Could you take a few moments? We're going to worship God in with this song. And I'm going to lead you into a prayer moment now. Would you pray this prayer together with me, God? Lord, I pray in Jesus' name. Break every mold. Break every rules that I didn't know. All the bondage that I put myself into. Set me free by the power of the Holy Spirit. Father, in the name of Jesus, let there be a new work of the Spirit in our lives, in our family, in our children, in our church. That we will follow the ministry of the Holy Spirit, the ministry of righteousness. That we will love God and we will run after His glory. Can I ask you just to lead you forward to say, God, I consecrate myself to you, God. Cover yourself in the blood of the Lamb right now. There will be no infestations, no virus, no molding. That the Spirit of God will cover you, wash you with His own wash you by the blood of the Lamb, sanctify you through the word of the Lord. All the stubborn sins, stubborn habits, stubborn attitude, stubborn thinking process to be broken in Jesus' name. To be broken in Jesus' name. Let Jesus show up today. Let it be broken in Jesus' name. The habitual sin, the habitual defeat, the habitual condemnation, the habitual low self-esteem. Let it be broken in Jesus' name. Let there be a rebirth of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. We give you glory, Father. We read in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 8. From the elders to the women to the people, they turned their backs from God. Therefore, regardless of your position in the church, would you say to Jesus, God, we want to face your glory face forward serving you make a consecration from the top leadership to the lowest person within the system if I can say that way 
Father, in the name of Jesus, consecrate our leadership, cleanse us. Our pastoral team, eldership, leaders who are serving, people who are coming, cleanse us in Jesus' name. From the men to the woman to the youth to the children, cleanse us in Jesus' name. We pray your glory will remain. Your throne will remain. Jesus is our King. Shahara Baha brought to the team. The Lord just showed me there is another major disease that is going to come. Another major breakout is coming. It is far more worse than SARS, than COVID. Will look like a baby in front of this disease that is coming. It is going to sweep the nations of the world. If today we will cover ourselves, wash ourselves, come into the glory of God. Jesus said in the book of Exodus, none of these diseases will come near the dwelling of the righteous. So cover us and cleanse us, Father. Shama Habroto. Can you take a few moments right now? Just only a few moments. Cover yourself by the blood of the Lamb. Cover yourself. Lende Shunumoka Dibaranga Kuzata. Itaini O Shurukatiya Bahabrata. This new disease that is going to come is going to create a confusion in the immune system. It will break down the defenses. To make everybody vulnerable to every floating viruses. Slender Kutare Sunu Sharabarabara. Ratala Mandori Satoramo Shakaba. Sabura Makadi Talebisura Mate. Cover Father. I pray for the blood of Jesus. Teenagers, young adults, young parents, you are blessed by God with education, freedom of thought, you are taught God's word. If you show your arrogance, questioning the very word of God or defying God's holiness through rebellion, the next wave that is coming will enter into that part of teenage and young adults group and death will come in. This is a warning from heaven this morning as the Lord is showing to me the next wave that is going to come. My brothers and sisters, my prayer warriors in Jesus, my King, will we just take two minutes to cry out for God's mercy? Will it take two minutes to cry out for God's love? The outpouring of the Holy Spirit for salvation of souls. That God's hand must come upon the church must come upon our children. Break the spirit of rebellion. Let there be true salvation. A born again in the spirit and in truth. Would you stand between the altar and the porch, crying out to the mercies of God. We pray for mercy. We cry for mercy. Shari mi aroto. Mercy. Mercy of God. Mercy of God. Mercy of God. Mercy of God. 
themselves the notes themselves will cry out before God's mercy the songs themselves will become songs of intercession pleading before God for his mercy as the judgment draws nigh the Bible says in the book of Exodus there was a great and a mighty cry in the land of Egypt when the people of God cry out to God and their cry came out to the ears of God and he sent them a man called Moses so the cry is going to come up Shamandia Sutura Italagadia Bahobro Shendi Leisekiri Endi Shakara Bahabroto Anoint our musicians, anoint our worship team, anoint our media team with a new anointing of worship, with a new anointing, with a new power, with a new grace. In the name of Jesus, release your power, God. Release your anointing, I pray. Release your anointing, I pray. In the name of Jesus, release your anointing, I pray. Father, we pray the mercies of God will continue to speak to us, minister to us. Help us to keep in step with the Holy Spirit as we serve you in this brand new day. Help us to think according to the mind of the Holy Spirit. Help us to serve in the Spirit and not in the flesh. I pray for the love of God. The mercies of Jesus Christ. And the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Be upon each one of us and our children. Today, tomorrow and forevermore. In Christ Jesus. Amen. Hey friends, thank you so much for watching this message. We trust that you've been tremendously blessed. If you have not done so, subscribe to the YouTube channel of Jesus My King, for we will be posting many more insightful programs that will surely help you in your journey with God. Tune in every Sunday at 10 a.m. Eastern Time for our live Sunday service here from Shelby, North Carolina. God bless and we'll see you soon. God has given